Preface of Hieroglyphic Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole. Preface. Shabaham ne comprenait jamais bien que les choses absurdes et au de toute vraisemblance. Le Sofa, page five. Strawberry Hill, printed by T. Kergate, 1785, preface. As the invaluable present I am making to the world may not please all tastes, from the gravity of the matter, the solidity of the reasoning, and the deep learning contained in the ensuing sheets, it is necessary to make some apology for producing this work in so trifling an age, when nothing will go down but temporary politics, personal satire, and idle romances the true reason then for my surmounting all these objections was singly this i was apprehensive lest the work should be lost to posterity and though it may be condemned at present i could have no doubt but it will be treated with due reverence some hundred ages hence when wisdom and learning shall have gained their proper ascendant over mankind and when men shall only read for instruction and improvement of their minds. As I shall print an hundred thousand copies, some it may be hoped will escape the havoc that is made of moral works, and then this jewel will shine forth in its genuine lustre. I was in the greater hurry to consign this work to the press, as I foresee that the art of printing will ere long be totally lost like other useful discoveries well known to the ancients such were the art of dissolving rocks with hot vinegar of teaching elephants to dance on the slack rope of making malleable glass of writing epic poems that anybody would read after they had been published a month and the stupendous invention of new religions a secret of which illiterate mahomet was the last person possessed notwithstanding this my zeal for good letters and the ardour of my universal citizenship for i declare i design this present for all nations there are some small difficulties in the way that prevent my conferring this my great benefaction on the world completely and all at once i am obliged to produce it in small portions and therefore beg the prayers of all good and wise men that my life may be prolonged to me till I shall be able to publish the whole work. No man else being capable of executing the charge so well as myself, for reasons that my modesty will not permit me to specify. In the meantime, as it is the duty of an editor to acquaint the world with what relates to himself as well as his author, I think it right to mention the causes that compel me to publish this work in numbers. The common reason of such proceeding is to make a book dearer for the ease of the purchases. It being supposed that most people had rather give twenty shillings by sixpence a fortnight than pay ten shillings once for all. Public spirited as this proceeding is, I must confess my reasons are more and merely personal. As my circumstances are very moderate and barely sufficient to maintain decently a gentleman of my abilities and learning, I cannot afford to print at once an hundred thousand copies of two volumes in folio, for that will be the whole mass of hieroglyphic tales when the work is perfected. In the next place, being very asthmatic and requiring a free communication of air, I lodge in the uppermost story of a house in an alley not far from St. Mary Axe, and as a great deal of good company lodges in the same mansion, it was by a considerable favour that I could obtain a single chamber to myself, which chamber is by no means large enough to contain the whole impression, for I designed to vend the copies myself, and, according to the practice of other great men, shall sign the first sheet myself with my own hand. Desirous as I am of acquainting the world with many more circumstances relative to myself, some private considerations prevent my indulging their curiosity any farther at present, 
but I shall take care to leave so minute an account of myself to some public library, that the future commentators and editors of this work shall not be deprived of all necessary lights. In the meantime, I beg the reader to accept the temporary compensation of an account of the author whose work I am publishing. The hieroglyphic tales were undoubtedly written a little before the creation of the world, and have ever since been preserved by oral tradition in the mountains of Cramp Craggery, an uninhabited island not yet discovered. Of these few facts we could have the most authentic attestations of several clergymen who remember to have heard them repeated by old men long before they, the said clergymen, were born. We do not trouble the reader with these attestations, as we're sure everybody will believe them as much as if they had seen them. It is more difficult to ascertain the true author. We might ascribe them with great probability to Cayman Elagorbikos, son of Quat. But besides that we're not certain that any such person ever existed, it is not clear that he ever wrote anything but a book of cookery, and that in heroic verse. Others give them to Quat's nurse, and a few to Hermes Trismegistus, though there is a passage in the latter's treatise on the harpsichord which directly contradicts the account of the first volcano in the 114th of the hieroglyphic tales. As Trismegistus's work is lost, it is impossible to decide now whether the discordance mentioned is so positive as has been asserted by many learned men, who only guess at the opinion of Hermes from other passages in his writings, and who indeed are not sure whether he was speaking of volcanoes or cheesecakes, for he drew so well that his hieroglyphics may often be taken for the most opposite things in nature, and as there is no subject which is not treated, it is not precisely known what he was discussing in any one of them. This is the nearest we can come to any certainty with regard to the author. But whether he wrote the tales six thousand years ago, as we believe, or whether they were written for him within these ten years, they are incontestably the most ancient work in the world. And though there is little imagination and still less invention in them, yet there are so many passages in them exactly resembling Homer that any man living would conclude they were imitated from that great poet if it was not certain that Homer borrowed from them, which I shall prove two ways. First, by giving Homer's parallel passages at the bottom of the page, and secondly, by translating Homer himself into prose, which will make him so unlike himself that nobody will think he could be an original writer. And when he has become totally lifeless and insipid, it will be impossible but tales should be preferred to the Iliad, especially as I design to put them into a kind of style that shall be neither verse nor prose a diction lately much used in tragedies and heroic poems, the former of which are really heroic poems from want of probability, as an antica moderno epic poem is in fact a mere tragedy, having little or no change of scene, no incidents but a ghost and a storm, and no events but the deaths of the principal actors. I will not detain the reader longer from the perusal of this invaluable work, but I must beseech the public to be expeditious in taking off the whole impression as fast as I can get it printed, because I must inform them that I have a more precious work in contemplation, namely a new Roman history, in which I mean to ridicule, detect and expose all ancient virtue and patriotism and show from original papers, which I'm going to write, and which I shall afterwards bury in the ruins of Carthage and then dig up, that it appears by the letters of Hanno, the Punic ambassador to Rome, that Scipio was in the pay of Hannibal, and that the dilatoriness of Fabius proceeded from his being a pensioner of the same general. I own 
this discovery will pierce my heart but as morality is best taught by showing how little effect it had on the best of men i will sacrifice the most virtuous names for the instruction of the present wicked generation and i cannot doubt but when once they have learned to detest the favourite heroes of antiquity they will become good subjects of the most pious king that ever lived since david who expelled the established royal family and then sung psalms to the memory of jonathan to whose prejudice he had succeeded to the throne end of preface Tale one of hieroglyphic tales by Horace Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A new Arabian Nights entertainment. At the foot of the great mountain Higonku was anciently situated the kingdom of Labidel. Geographers who are not apt to make such just comparisons said it resembled a football just going to be kicked away, and so it happened for the mountain kicked the kingdom into the ocean, and it has never been heard of since. One day a young princess had climbed up to the top of the mountain to gather goat's eggs, the whites of which are excellent for taking off freckles. Goat's eggs, yes, naturalists hold that all beings are conceived in an egg. The goats of Higong Kuhu might be oviparous and lay their eggs to be hatched by the sun. This is my supposition, no matter whether I believe it myself or not. I will write against and abuse any man that opposes my hypothesis. It will be fine indeed if learned men were obliged to believe what they assert. The other side of the mountain was inhabited by a nation of whom the Labadellians knew no more than the French nobility do of Great Britain, which they think is an island that somehow or other may be approached by land. The princess had strayed into the confines of Kukuruku when she suddenly found herself seized by the guards of the prince that reigned in that country. They told her in few words that she must be conveyed to the capital and married to the giant, their lord and emperor. The giant, it seems, was fond of having a new wife every night, who was to tell him a story that would last till morning and then have her head cut off. Such odd ways have some folks of passing their wedding nights. The princess modestly asked why their master loved such long stories. The captain of the guard replied, His Majesty did not sleep well. Well, said she, and if he does not? Not, but I believe I can tell as long stories as any princess in Asia. Nay, I can repeat Leonidas by heart. Your emperor must be wakeful indeed if he can hold out against that. By this time they were arrived at the palace. To the great surprise of the princess, the emperor, so far from being a giant, was but five feet one inch in height. But being two inches taller than any of his predecessors, the flattery of his courtiers had bestowed the name of giant on him, and he affected to look down on any man above his own stature. The princess was immediately undressed and put to bed, his majesty being impatient to hear a new story. Light of my eyes, said the emperor, what is your name? I call myself the princess Gronovia, replied she, but my real appellation is the Frau Grona. And what is the use of a name, said his majesty, but to be called by it? And why do you pretend to be a princess if you are not? My turn is romantic, answered she, and I have ever had the ambition of being the heroine of a novel. Now there are but two conditions that entitle one to that rank. One must be a shepherdess or a princess. Well, content yourself, said the giant. You will die an empress without being either the one or the other. But what sublime reason had you for lengthening your name so unaccountably it is a custom in my family said she all my ancestors were learned men who wrote about the romans it sounded more classic 
and gave a higher opinion of their literature to put a latin termination to their names all this is japanese to me said the emperor but your ancestors seem to have been a parcel of mountebanks does one understand anything the better for corrupting one's name oh said the princess but it showed taste too there was a time in italy the learned carried this still farther and a man with a large forehead who was born on the fifth of january called himself quintus januarius fronto more and more absurd said the emperor you seem to have a great deal of impertinent knowledge about a great many impertinent people but proceed in your story whence came you my dear said she i was born in holland the deuce you was said the emperor and where is that it was nowhere replied the princess sprightlily till my countrymen gained it from the sea indeed moppet said his majesty and pray who were your countrymen before you had any country your majesty asks a very shrewd question said she which i cannot resolve on a sudden but i will step home to my library and consult five or six thousand volumes of modern history and an hundred or two dictionaries and an abridgment of geography and forty volumes in folio and be back in an instant not so fast my life said the emperor you must not rise till you go to execution it is now one in the morning and you have not begun your story my great-grandfather continued the princess was a dutch merchant who passed many years in japan on what account said the emperor he went thither to abjure his religion said she that he might get money enough to return and defend it against philip the second you are a pleasant family said the emperor but though i love fables i hate genealogies i know in all families by their own account there never was anything but good and great men from father to son a sort of fiction that does not at all amuse me in my dominions there is no nobility but flattery whoever flatters me best has created a great lord and the titles i confer are synonymous to their merits there is kiss my breech can my favourite adulation can lord treasurer prerogative can head of the law and blasphemy can high priest whoever speaks truth corrupts his blood and is ipso facto degraded in Europe you allow a man to be noble because one of his ancestors was a flatterer. But everything degenerates the farther it is removed from its source. I will not hear a word of any of your race before your father. What was he? It was in the height of the contests about the bull Unigenitus. I tell you, interrupted the emperor, I will not be plagued with any more of those people with Latin names. They were a parcel of coxcombs and seem to have infected you with their folly i am sorry replied granovia that your sublime highness is so little acquainted with the state of europe as to take a papal ordinance for a person unigenitus is latin for the jesuits and who the devil are the jesuits said the giant you explain one nonsensical term by another and wonder i am never the wiser sir said the princess if you will permit me to give you a short account of the troubles that have agitated Europe for these last two hundred years, on the doctrines of grace, free will, predestination, reprobation, justification, etc., you will be more entertained, and will believe less, than if I told your majesty a long story of fairies and goblins. You are an eternal praetor, said the emperor, and very self-sufficient, but talk your fill, and upon what subject do you like till tomorrow morning? But I swear by the soul of the holy Jirigi who rode to heaven on the tail of a magpie, as soon as the clock strikes eight, you are a dead woman. Well, who was the Jesuit Unigenitus? The novel doctrines that had sprung up in Germany, said Granovia, made it necessary for the church to look about her. The disciples of Loyola, of whom, said the emperor yawning, Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, replied Granovia, was a writer of Roman history, I suppose, interrupted the emperor. What the devil were the Romans to you that you trouble your head so much about them? 
the empire of rome and the church of rome are two distinct things said the princess and yet one may say the one depends upon the other as the new testament depends on the old one destroyed the other and yet pretends to a right to its inheritance the temporalities of the church what's a clock said the emperor to the chief eunuch cannot shall be far from eight this woman has gossiped at least seven hours do you hear my to-morrow's wife shall be dumb cut her tongue out before you bring her to our bed madam said the eunuch his sublime highness whose erudition passes the lands of the sea is too well acquainted with all human sciences to require information it is therefore that his exalted wisdom prefers accounts of what never happened to any relation either in history or divinity you lie said the emperor when i exclude truth i certainly do not mean to forbid divinity how many divinities have you in europe woman the council of trent replied granovia has decided the emperor began to snore i mean continued granovia that notwithstanding all father paul has asserted cardinal pallavicini affirms that in the first three sessions of the council the emperor was now fast asleep which the princess and the chief eunuch perceiving clapped several pillows upon his face and held them there till he expired as soon as they were convinced he was dead the princess putting on every mark of despair and concern issued to the divan where she was immediately proclaimed empress the emperor it was given out had died of an hemorrhoidal colic but to show her regard for his memory her imperial majesty declared she would strictly adhere to the maxims by which he had governed accordingly she espoused a new husband every night but dispensed with their telling her stories and was graciously pleased also upon their good behaviour to emit the subsequent execution she sent presents to all the learned men in asia and they in return did not fail to cry her up as a pattern of clemency wisdom and virtue and though the panegyrics of the learned are generally as clumsy as they are fulsome they ventured to allure her that their writings would be as durable as brass and that the memory of her glorious reign would reach to the latest posterity End of A New Arabian Nights Entertainment Tale 2 of Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King and His Three Daughters There was formerly a king who had three daughters. That is, he would have had three if he'd had one more, but somehow or other the eldest never was born. She was extremely handsome, had a great deal of wit, and spoke French in perfection, as all the authors of that age affirm, and yet none of them pretend that she ever existed. It is very certain that the two other princesses were far from beauties. The second had a strong Yorkshire dialect and the youngest had bad teeth and but one leg, which occasioned her dancing very ill. As it was not probable that His Majesty would have any more children, being eighty-seven years, two months, and thirteen days old when his queen died, the states of the kingdom were very anxious to have the princesses married. But there was one great obstacle to this settlement, though so important to the peace of the kingdom, the king insisted that his eldest daughter should be married first, and as there was no such person, it was very difficult to fix upon a proper husband for her. The courtiers all approved of his majesty's resolution, but as under the best princes there will always be a number of discontented. The nation was torn into different factions, the grumblers, or patriots, insisting that the second princess was the eldest, and ought to be declared heiress apparent to the crown. Many pamphlets were written pro and con, but the ministerial party pretended that the Chancellor's argument was unanswerable, who affirmed that the second princess could not be the eldest, 
as no Princess Royal ever had a Yorkshire accent. A few persons who were attached to the youngest princess took advantage of this plea for whispering that her Royal Highness's pretensions to the crown were the best of all. For as there was no eldest princess, and as the second must be the first if there was no first, and as she could not be the second if she was the first, and as the Chancellor had proved that she could not be the first, it followed plainly by every idea of law that she could be nobody at all. And then the consequence followed, of course, that the youngest must be the eldest if she had no elder sister. It is inconceivable what animosities and mischiefs arose from these different titles, and each faction endeavoured to strengthen itself by foreign alliances. The court party, having no real object for their attachment, were the most attached of all, and made up by warmth for the want of foundation in their principles. The clergy, in general, were devoted to this, which was styled the first party. The physicians embraced the second, and the lawyers declared for the third, or the faction of the youngest princess, because it seemed the best to calculate to admit of doubts and endless litigation. While the nation was in this distracted situation, there arrived the Prince of Quifferiquimini, who would have been the most accomplished hero of the age if he had not been dead, and had spoken any language but the Egyptian, and had not had three legs. Notwithstanding these blemishes, the eyes of the whole nation were immediately turned upon him, and each party wished to see him married to the princess whose cause they espoused. The old king received him with the most distinguished honours. The senate made the most fulsome addresses to him. The princesses were so taken with him that they grew more bitter enemies than ever, and the court ladies and petit maîtres invented a thousand new fashions upon his account. Everything was to be a la quiferiquimini. Both men and women of fashion left off rouge to look the more cadaverous. Their clothes were embroidered with hieroglyphics, and all the ugly characters they could gather from Egyptian antiquities, with which they were forced to be contented, it being impossible to learn a language that is lost. And all tables, chairs, stools, cabinets, and couches were made with only three legs. The last, however, soon went out of fashion as being very inconvenient. The prince, who ever since his death had had but a weakly constitution, was a little fatigued with this excess of attentions, and would often wish himself at home in his coffin. But his greatest difficulty of all was to get rid of the youngest princess, who kept hopping after him wherever he went, and was so full of admiration of his three legs, and so modest about having but one herself, and so inquisitive to know how his three legs were set on, that being the best-natured man in the world, it went to his heart whenever in a fit of peevishness he happened to drop an impatient word, which never failed to throw her into an agony of tears, and then she looked so ugly that it was impossible for him to be tolerably civil to her. He was not much inclined to the second princess. In truth, it was the eldest who had made the conquest of his affections, and so violently did his passion increase one Tuesday morning, that breaking through all prudential considerations, for there were many reasons which ought to have determined his choice in favour of either of the other sisters, he hurried to the old king, acquainted him with his love, and demanded the eldest princess in marriage. Nothing could equal the joy of the good old monarch, he wished for nothing but to live and see the consummation of this match. Throwing his arms about the prince skeleton's neck and watering his hollow cheeks with warm tears, he granted his request, and added that he would immediately resign his crown to him and his favourite daughter. I am forced for want of room to pass over many circumstances that would add greatly to the beauty of this history. 
and I am sorry I must dash the reader's impatience by acquainting him that notwithstanding the eagerness of the old king and youthful ardour of the prince, the nuptials were obliged to be postponed. The archbishop declaring that it was essentially necessary to have a dispensation from the pope, the parties being related within the forbidden degrees, a woman that never was, and a man that had been, being deemed first cousins in the eye of canon law. Hence arose a new difficulty. The religion of the Quiferiquiminians was totally opposite to that of the papists. The former believed in nothing but grace, and they had a high priest of their own who pretended that he was master of the whole fee simple of grace, and by that possession could cause everything to have been that never had been, and could prevent everything that had been from ever having been. We have nothing to do, said the prince to the king, but to send a solemn embassy to the high priest of grace with a present of a hundred thousand million of ingots, and he will cause your charming no daughter to have been, and will prevent my having died, and then there will be no occasion for a dispensation from your old fool at Rome. Ha! Thou impious, atheistical bag of dry bones, cried the old king. Dost thou profane our holy religion? Thou shalt have no daughter of mine, thou three-legged skeleton. Go and be buried, and be damned, as thou must be, for as thou art dead, thou art past repentance. I would sooner give my child to a baboon, who has one leg more than thou hast, than bestow her on such a reprobate corpse. You had better give your one-legged infanta to the baboon, said the prince. They are fitter for one another. As much a corpse as I am, I am preferable to nobody. And who the devil would have married your no daughter but a dead body? For my religion, I lived and died in it. And it's not in my power to change it now if I would. But for your part, a great shout interrupted this dialogue, and the captain of the guard, rushing into the royal closet, acquainted his majesty that, the second princess, in revenge of the prince's neglect, had given her hand to a dry salter who was a common council man, and that the city, in consideration of the match, had proclaimed them king and queen, allowing his majesty to retain the title for his life, which they had fixed for the term of six months, and ordering, in respect of his royal birth, that the prince should immediately lie in state and have a pompous funeral. This revolution was so sudden and so universal that all parties approved, or were forced to seem to approve it. The old king died the next day, as the courtiers said, for joy. The prince of Quirifiquimini was buried, in spite of his appeal to the law of nations, and the youngest princess went distracted and was shut up in a madhouse, calling out day and night for a husband with three legs. End of The King and His Three Daughters Tale three of Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dice Box, a fairy tale. Translated from the French translation of the Countess Donois for the entertainment of Miss Caroline Campbell. There was a merchant of Damascus named Abu Kazim, who had an only daughter called Pissimissi, which signifies the waters of Jordan, because a fairy foretold at her birth that she would become one of Solomon's concubines. Azaziel, the angel of death, having transported Abul Kazem to the regions of bliss, he had no fortune to bequeath to his beloved child but the shell of a pistachia nut drawn by an elephant and a ladybird. Pissy Missy, who was but nine years old, and who had been kept in great confinement, was impatient to see the world, and no sooner was the breath out of her father's body than she got into the car and whipping her elephant and ladybird, drove out of the yard as fast as possible, without knowing 
whither she was going. Her courses never stopped till they came to the foot of a brazen tower that had neither doors nor windows, in which lived an old enchantress who had locked herself up there with seventeen thousand husbands. It had but one single vent for air, which was a small chimney grated over, through which it was scarce possible to put one's hand. Pissy Missy, who was very impatient, ordered her courses to fly with her up to the top of the chimney, which, as they were the most docile creatures in the world, they immediately did. But, unluckily, the forepaw of the elephant lighting on the top of the chimney broke down the grate by its weight, but at the same time stopped up the passage so entirely that all the enchantress's husbands were stifled for want of air. As it was a collection she had made with great care and cost, it is easy to imagine her vexation and rage. She raised a storm of thunder and lightning that lasted eight hundred and four years, and having conjured up an army of two thousand devils, she ordered them to flay the elephant alive and dress it for her supper with anchovy sauce. Nothing could have saved the poor beast if, struggling to get loose from the chimney, he had not, happily, broken wind, which it seems is a great preservative against devils. They all flew a thousand ways, and in their hurry carried away half the brazen tower, by which means the elephant, the car, the ladybird, and Pissimini got loose. But in their fall tumbled through the roof of an apothecary's shop and broke all his bottles of physic. The elephant, who was very dry with his fatigue, and who had not much taste, immediately sucked up all the medicines with his proboscis, which occasioned such a variety of effects in his bowels that it was well he had such a strong constitution, or he must have died of it. His evacuations were so plentiful that he not only drowned the Tower of Babel, near which the apothecary's shop stood, but the current ran fourscore leagues till it came to the sea, and there poisoned so many whales and leviathans, that a pestilence ensued, and lasted three years, nine months, and sixteen days. As the elephant was extremely weakened by what had happened, it was impossible for him to draw the car for eighteen months, which was a cruel delay to Pissy Missy's impatience, who during all that time could not travel above a hundred miles a day, for as she carried the sick animal in her lap, the poor ladybird could not make longer stages with no assistance. Besides, Pissy Missy bought everything she saw wherever she came, and all was crowded into the car and stuffed into the seat. She had purchased ninety-two dolls, seventeen baby houses, six cartloads of sugar plums, a thousand ells of gingerbread, eight dancing dogs, a bear and a monkey, four toy shops with all their contents, and seven dozen of bibs and aprons of the newest fashion. They were jogging on with all this cargo over Mount Caucasus, when an immense hummingbird, who had been struck with the beauty of the ladybird's wings, that I had forgot to say were of ruby spotted with black pearls, sousing down at once upon her prey, swallowed Ladybird, Pissy Missy, the Elephant, and all their commodities. It happened that the hummingbird belonged to Solomon. He let it out of its cage every morning after breakfast, and it constantly came home by the time the council broke up. Nothing could equal the surprise of His Majesty and the courtiers when the dear little creature arrived, with the elephant's proboscis hanging out of its divine little bill. However, after the first astonishment was over, His Majesty, who to be sure was wisdom itself, and who understood natural philosophy, that it was a charm to hear him discourse of those matters, and was actually making a collection of dried beasts and birds in twelve thousand volumes of the best foolscap paper, immediately perceived what had happened, and taking out of the side pocket of his breeches a diamond toothpick case of his own turning, with the toothpick made of the only unicorn's horn he ever saw, he stuck it into the elephant's snout and began to draw it out. 
but all his philosophy was confounded when jammed between the elephant's legs he perceived the head of a beautiful girl and between her legs a baby house which with the wings extended thirty feet out of the windows of which rained a torrent of sugar plums that had been placed there to make room then followed the bear who had been pressed into the bales of gingerbread and was covered all over with it and looked but uncouthly and the monkey with a doll in every paw and his pouches so crammed with sugar plums that they hung on each side of him and trailed on the ground behind like the duchess of blank's beautiful breasts solomon however gave small attention to this procession being caught with the charms of the lovely pissy missy he immediately began the song of songs extempore and what he had seen i mean all that came out of the humming bird's throat had made such a jumble in his ideas there was nothing so unlike to which he did not compare all pissy minnie's beauties as he sung his canticles too to no tune and god knows had but a bad voice they were far from comforting pissy missy the elephant had torn her best bib and apron and she cried and roared and kept such a squalling that though solomon carried her in his arms and showed her all the fine things in the temple there was no pacifying her the queen of sheba who was playing at backgammon with the high priest and who came every october to converse with solomon though she did not understand a word of hebrew hearing the noise came running out of her dressing-room and seeing the king with a squalling child in his arms asked him peevishly if it became his reputed wisdom to expose himself with his bastards to all the court solomon instead of replying kept singing we have a little sister and she has no breasts which so provoked the sheban princess that happening to have one of the dice-boxes in her hand she without any ceremony threw it at his head the enchantress whom i mentioned before and who though invisible had followed pissy missy and drawn her into her train of misfortunes turned the dice-box aside and directed it to pissy missy's nose which being something flat like madame de blanc it stuck there and being of ivory solomon ever after compared his beloved's nose to the tower that leads to damascus the queen though ashamed of her behaviour was not in her heart sorry for the accident but when she found that it only increased the monarch's passion her contempt redoubled and calling him a thousand old fools to herself she ordered her post-chaise and drove away in a fury without leaving sixpence for the servants and nobody knows what became of her or her kingdom which has never been heard of since end of the dice box a fairy tale tale four of hieroglyphic tales by horace walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain tale four the peach in brandy a malaysian tale note this tale was written for Anne Liddell, Countess of Ossory, wife of John Fitzpatrick, Earl of Ossory. They had a daughter, Anne, the subject of this story. Fitzganam Magillapadruig, King of Kilkenny, the thousand and fifty seventh descendant in a direct line from Malesius, King of Spain, footnote, Vide Lodges, Peerage of Ireland, in the family of Fitzpatrick, end footnote, had an only daughter called great a and by corruption greater who being arrived at years of discretion and perfectly initiated by her royal parents in the arts of government the fond monarch determined to resign his crown to her having accordingly assembled the senate he declared his resolution to them and having delivered his sceptre into the princess's hand he obliged her to ascend the throne and to set the example was the first to kiss her hand 
and vow eternal obedience to her. The senators were ready to stifle the new queen with panegyrics and addresses. The people, though they adored the old king, were transported with having a new sovereign. And the university, according to custom immemorial, presented Her Majesty three months after everybody else had forgotten the event with testimonials of the excessive sorrow and excessive joy they felt on losing one monarch and getting another. Her Majesty was now in the fifth year of her age and a prodigy of sense and goodness. In her first speech to the Senate, which she lisped with inimitable grace, she assured them that her heart was entirely Irish. Footnote Queen Anne, in her first speech to the Parliament, said her heart was entirely English. End footnote. And that she did not intend any longer to go in leading strings. As a proof of which, she immediately declared her nurse Prime Minister. The Senate applauded this sage choice with even greater encomiums than the last, and voted a free gift to the Queen of a million of sugar plums, and to the favourite of twenty thousand bottles of Oscar Her Majesty then, jumping from her throne, declared it was her royal pleasure to play at blind man's buff. But such a hubbub arose from the senators pushing and pressing and squeezing and punching one another to endeavour to be the first blinded, that in the scuffle Her Majesty was thrown down and got a bump on her forehead as big as a pigeon's egg, which set her a squalling that you might have heard her in Tipperary. The old king flew into a rage and, snatching up the mace, knocked out the Chancellor's brains, who at that time happened not to have any, and the Queen Mother, who sat in a tribune above to see the ceremony, fell into a fit and miscarried of twins who were killed by Her Majesty's fright. Footnote, Lady Ossery had miscarried just then of two sons. End footnote. But the Earl of Bullaboo, great butler of the Crown, happening to stand next to the Queen, catched up one of the dead children, and, perceiving it was a boy, ran down to the King and wished him joy of the birth of a son and heir. Footnote. The housekeeper, as soon as Lord Ossery came home, wished him joy of a son and heir, though both the children were born dead. End of footnote. The king, who had now recovered his sweet temper, called him a fool and a blunderer. Upon which Mr. Fellamo Torture, a zealous courtier, started up with great presence of mind, and accused the Earl of Bullaboo of high treason for having asserted that his late majesty had had any other heir than their present most lawful and most religious sovereign queen greater. An impeachment was voted by a large majority, though not without warm opposition, particularly from a celebrated Kilkennian orator whose name is unfortunately not come down to us, it being erased out of the journals afterwards. As the Irish author whom I copy says, when he became first Lord of the Treasury, as he was during the whole reign of Queen Greta's successor. The argument of this Mr. Kim Morakil, says my author, whose name is lost, was that Her Majesty the Queen Mother, having conceived a son before the King's resignation, that son was indubitably heir to the Crown, and consequently the resignation void, it not signifying an iota whether the child was born, or alive, or dead, it was alive, said he, when it was conceived. Here he was called to order by Dr. O'Flaherty, the Queen Mother's man midwife, and member for the borough of Corbelly, who entered into a learned dissertation on embryos, but he was interrupted by the young Queen's crying for her supper, the previous question for which was carried without a negative. And then, the house being resumed, the debate was cut short by the impatience of the majority to go and drink Her Majesty's health. This seeming violence gave occasion to a very long protest drawn up by Sir Archie McSarcasm, in which he contrived to state the claim of the departed fetus so artfully that it produced a civil war, 
and gave rise to those bloody ravages and massacres which so long laid waste the ancient kingdom of Kilkenny, and which were at last terminated by a lucky accident, well known, says my author to everybody, but which he thinks it his duty to relate for the sake of those who never may have heard of it. These are his words. It happened that the Archbishop of Tum, anciently called Maum by the Roman Catholic clergy, the great wit of those times, was in the Queen Mother's closet, who had the young Queen in her lap. Footnote. Some commentators have ignorantly supposed that the Irish author is guilty of a great anachronism in this passage, for having said that the contested succession occasioned long wars, he yet speaks of Queen Greater at the conclusion of the all is still sitting in her mother's lap as a child. Now, I can confute them from their own state of the question. Like a child does not import that she actually was a child, she only sat like a child, and so she might, though thirty years old. Civilians have declared at what period of his life a king may be of age before he is, but neither Grotius nor Puffendorf nor any of the tribe have determined how long a king or queen may remain infants after they are past their infancy. End of footnote. His grace was suddenly seized with a violent fit of the colic, which made him make such wry faces that the queen mother thought he was going to die and ran out of the room to send for a physician, for she was a pattern of goodness and void of pride. While she was stepped into the servants' hall to call somebody, according to the simplicity of those times, the archbishop's pains increased, when, perceiving something on the mantelpiece which he took for a peach in brandy, he gulped it all down at once, without saying grace, God forgive him, and found great comfort in it. He had not done licking his lips before the Queen Mother returned, when Queen Grato cried out, Mamma! Mamma, the gentleman has et my little brother. This fortunate event put an end to the contest, the male line entirely failing in the person of the devoured prince. The archbishop, however, who became pope by the name of Innocent the Third, having afterwards a son by his sister, named the child Fitzpatrick, as having some of the royal blood in its veins and from him are descended all the younger branches of the Fitzpatricks of our time. Now, the rest of the acts of greater and all that she did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Kilkenny? End of The Peach in Brandy, a Milesian Tale Tale five of Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tale five, Mi Lai, a Chinese fairy tale. Mi Lai, prince of China, was brought up by his godmother, the fairy He, who was famous for telling fortunes with a teacup. From that unerring oracle, she assured him that he would be the most unhappy man alive unless he married a princess whose name was the same with her father's dominions. As in all probability there could not be above one person in the world to whom that accident had happened, the prince thought there would be nothing so easy as to learn who his destined bride was. He had been too well educated to put the question to his godmother, for he knew when she uttered an oracle, that it was with intention to perplex, not to inform, which has made people so fond of consulting all those who do not give an explicit answer, such as prophets, lawyers, and anybody you meet on the road who, if you ask the way, reply by desiring to know whence you came. Milai was no sooner returned to his palace than he sent for his governor, who was deaf and dumb, qualities for which the fairy had selected him that he might not instil any bad principles into his pupil. However, in recompense, he could talk upon his fingers like an angel. Milai asked him directly who the princess was, whose name was the same as her father's kingdom. 
This was a little exaggeration in the prince, but nobody ever repeats anything just as they heard it. Besides, it was excusable in the air of a great monarchy who of all things had not been taught to speak truth, and perhaps had never heard what it was. Still, it was not the mistake of kingdom for dominions that puzzled the governor. It never helped him to understand anything the better for its being rightly stated. However, as he had great presence of mind, which consisted in never giving a direct answer, and in looking as if he could, he replied, It is a question of too great importance to be resolved on a sudden. How came you to know that? said the prince. This youthful impetuosity told the governor that there was something more in the question than he had apprehended, and though he could be very solemn about nothing, he was ten times more so when there was something he did not comprehend. Yet that unknown something, occasioning a conflict between his cunning and his ignorance, and the latter being the greater, always betrayed itself, for nothing looks so silly as a fool acting wisdom. The prince repeated his question. The governor demanded why he asked. The prince had not the patience to spell the question over again on his fingers, but bawled it as loud as he could. To no purpose. The courtiers ran in, and catching up the prince's words, and repeating them imperfectly, it soon flew all over Peking, and thence into the provinces, and thence into Tartary, and thence to Muscovy, and so on, that the prince wanted to know who the princess was whose name was the same as her father's. As the Chinese have not the blessing for aught I know of having family surnames as we have, and as what would be their Christian names if they were so happy as to be Christians, are quite different for men and women. The Chinese, who think that must be a rule all over the world because it is theirs, decided that there could not exist upon the square face of the earth a woman whose name was the same as her father's. They repeated this so often, and with so much deference and so much obstinacy, that the prince, totally forgetting the original oracle, believed that he wanted to know who the woman was who had the same name as her father. However, remembering there was something in the question that he had taken for royal, he always said, the king, her father. The Prime Minister consulted the Red Book or Court Calendar, which was his oracle, and could find no such princess. All the ministers at foreign courts were instructed to inform themselves that there was any such lady, but as it took up a great deal of time to put these instructions into cipher, the prince's impatience could not wait for the courier's setting out, but he determined to go himself in search of the princess. The old king, who, as is usual, had left the whole management of affairs to his son the moment he was fourteen, was charmed with the prince's resolution of seeing the world, which he thought could be done in a few days, the facility of which makes so many monarchs never stir out of their own palaces till it is too late. And his majesty declared that he should approve of his son's choice be the lady who she would, provided she answered to the divine designation of having the same name as her father. The prince rode post to Canton, intending to embark there on board an English man of war, what infinite transport did he hear the evening before he was to embark that a sailor knew the identic lady in question? The prince scalded his mouth with the tea he was drinking, broke the old china cup it was in, and which the queen his mother had given him at his departure from Peking, and which had been given to her great-great-great-great-grandmother Queen Fi by Confucius himself and ran down to the vessel and asked for the man who knew his bride. It was honest Tom O'Bull, an Irish sailor, who by his interpreter Mr. James Hall, the supercargo, informed His Highness that Mr. Bob Oliver of Sligo had a daughter christened of both his names, the fair Miss Bob Oliver. Footnote, there really was such a person, 
the prince by the plenitude of his power declared tom a mandarin of the first class and at tom's desire promised to speak to his brother the king of great ireland france and britain to have him made a peer in his own country tom saying he should be ashamed to appear there without being a lord as well as all his acquaintance the prince's passion which was greatly inflamed by tom's description of her highness bob's charms would not let him stay for a proper set of ladies from Pekin to carry to wait on his bride so he took a dozen of the wives of the first merchants in canton and two dozen virgins as maids of honour who however were disqualified for their employments before his highness got to st helena tom himself married one of them but was so great a favourite with the prince that she was still appointed maid of honour and with tom's consent was afterwards married to an english duke nothing can paint the agonies of our royal lover when on his landing at dublin he was informed that princess bob had quitted ireland and was married to nobody knew whom it was well for tom that he was on irish ground he would have been chopped as small as rice for it is death in china to mislead the heir of the crown through ignorance to do it knowingly is no crime any more than in other countries as a prince of china cannot marry a woman that has been married before it was necessary for me lie to search the world for another lady equally qualified with miss bob whom he forgot the moment he was told he must marry somebody else and fell equally in love with somebody else though he knew not with whom in this suspense he dreamt that he would find his destined spouse whose father had lost the dominions which never had been his dominions in a place where there was a bridge over no water a tomb where nobody ever was buried nor ever would be buried ruins that were more than they had ever been a subterraneous passage in which there were dogs with eyes of rubies and emeralds and a more beautiful menagerie of chinese pheasants than any in his father's extensive gardens this oracle seemed to be so impossible to be accomplished that he believed it more than he had done the first which showed his great piety he determined to begin his second search and being told by the lord lieutenant that there was in england a mr banks footnote the gentleman who discovered otaheite in company with dr solander end of footnote who was going all over the world in search of he did not know what his highness thought he could not have a better conductor and sailed for england there he learnt that the sage banks was at oxford hunting in the bodleian library for a manuscript voyage of a man who had been in the moon which mr banks thought must have been in the western ocean where the moon sets and which planet if he could discover once more he would take possession of in his majesty's name upon condition that it should never be taxed and so be lost again to this country like the rest of his majesty's dominions in that part of the world Meli took a hired post chaise for oxford as it was a little rotten it broke on the new road down to henley a beggar advised him to walk into general conway's who was the most courteous person alive and would certainly lend him his own chaise the prince travelled incog he took the beggar's advice but going up to the house was told the family were in the grounds but he should be conducted to them he was led through a venerable wood of beeches to a menagerie commanding a more glorious prospect than any in his father's dominions and full of chinese pheasants footnote lady Aylesbury's. the prince cried out in ecstasy oh potent he my dream begins to be accomplished the gardener who knew no chinese but the names of a few plants was struck with the similitude of the sounds but discreetly said not a word not finding his lady there as he expected he turned back and plunging suddenly into the thickest gloom of the wood he descended into a cavern totally dark 
the intrepid prince following him boldly. After advancing a great way into this subterraneous vault, at last they perceived light, when on a sudden they were pursued by several small spaniels, and turning to look at them the prince perceived their eyes shone like emeralds and rubies. Footnote. At Park Place there is such a passage cut through a chalk hill. When dogs are in the middle, the light from the mouth makes their eyes appear in the manner here described. End of footnote. Instead of being amazed, as Fo Hai, the founder of his race, would have been, the prince renewed his exclamations and cried, I advance, I advance, I shall find my bride. Great he, thou art infallible. Emerging into light, the imperturbed gardener, footnote Copeland, the gardener, a very grave person, conducted his highness to a heap of artificial ruins, footnote, Consequently, they seem to have been larger. Beneath which they found a spacious gallery or arcade, where His Highness was asked if he would not repose himself. But instead of answering, he capered like one frantic, crying out, I advance, I advance, great he, I advance. The gardener was amazed, and doubted whether he was not conducting a madman to his master and lady, and hesitated whether he should proceed, but as he understood nothing the prince said, and perceiving he must be a foreigner, he concluded he was a Frenchman by his dancing. As the stranger, too, was so nimble and not at all tired with his walk, the sage gardener proceeded down a sloping valley between two mountains clothed to their summits with cedars, firs, and pines, which he took care to tell the prince were all of his honour the general's own planting. But though the prince had learnt more English in three days in Ireland than all the French in the world ever learnt in three years, he took no notice of the information, to the great offence of the gardener, but kept running on, and increased his gambles and exclamations when he perceived the veil was terminated by a stupendous bridge that seemed composed of the rocks which the giants threw at Jupiter's head, and had not a drop of water beneath it, Footnote, the rustic bridge at Park Place was built by General Conway to carry the road from Henley and to leave the communication free between his grounds on each side of the road. Vide last page of the fourth volume of Anecdotes of Painting. End of footnote. Where is my bride, my bride? cried Milai. I must be near her. The prince's shouts and cries drew a matron from a cottage that stood on a precipice near the bridge and hung over the river. "'My lady is down at Ford House,' cried the good woman, who was a little deaf, concluding that they had called her to know. Footnote, the old woman who kept the cottage built by General Conway to command a glorious prospect. Ford House is a farmhouse at the termination of the grounds. End of footnote. The gardener knew it was in vain to explain his distress to her, and thought that if the poor gentleman was really mad, his master the general would be the properest person to know how to manage him. Accordingly, turning to the left, he led the prince along the banks of the river, which glittered through the opening fallows, while on the other hand a wilderness of shrubs climbed up the pendant cliffs of chalk, and contrasted with the verdant meads and fields of corn beyond the stream. The prince, insensible to such enchanting scenes, galloped wildly along, keeping the poor gardener on a round trot, till they were stopped by a lonely tomb surrounded by cypress, yews and willows, that seemed the monument of some adventurous youth who had been lost in tempting the current, and might have suited the gallant and daring Leander. Footnote, a fictitious tomb in a beautiful spot by the river, built for a point of view. It has a small pyramid on it. End of footnote. Here, Milai first had presence of mind to recollect the little English he knew, and eagerly asked the gardener whose tomb he beheld before him. It is nobody's. Before he could proceed, the prince interrupted him, and would it never be anybody's? Ah. Uh -huh thought the gardener. Now there is no longer any doubt of his frenzy, and perceiving his master and the family approaching towards them, 
he endeavoured to get the start but the prince much younger and born too on the wings of love set out full speed the moment he saw the company and particularly a young damsel with them running almost breathless up to lady aylesbury and seizing miss campbell's hand he cried who's she who's she lady aylesbury screamed the young maiden squalled the general cool but offended rushed between them and if a prince could be collared would have collared him Milai kept fast hold with one arm but pointing to his prize with the other and with the most eager and supplicating looks entreating for an answer continued to exclaim who's she who's she the general perceiving by his accent and manner that he was a foreigner and rather tempted to laugh than be angry replied with civil scorn why she is miss caroline campbell daughter of lord william campbell his majesty's late governor of carolina oh he i now recollect thy words cried me lie and so she became princess of china End of Mi Lai, a Chinese fairy tale. Tale six of Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A true love story. In the height of the animosities between the factions of the Guelphs and Ghibellines, a party of Venetians had made an inroad into the territories of the Viscontis sovereigns of milan and had carried off the young oridates then at a nurse his family were at that time under a cloud though they could boast of being descended from canus scaliger lord of verona the captors sold the beautiful oridates to a rich widow of the noble family of grimaldi who having no children brought him up with as much tenderness as if he had been her son her fondness increased with the growth of his stature and charms, and the violence of his passions were augmented by the Signora Grimaldi's indulgence. Is it necessary to say that love reigned predominantly in the soul of Orondates, or that in a city like Venice a form like that of Orondates met with little resistance? The Cyprian queen not content with the numerous oblations of Orondates on her altars, was not satisfied while his heart remained unengaged. Across the canal, over against the palace of Grimaldi, stood a convent of Carmelite nuns, the abbess of which had a young African slave of the most exquisite beauty called Azora, a year younger than Orondates. Jet and Japan were tawny and without lustre when compared to the hue of Azora. Afric never produced a female so perfect as Azora, as Europe could boast of but one Orondates. The Signora Grimaldi, though no bigot, was pretty regular at her devotions, but as Lansquenet was more to her taste than praying, she hurried over her masses as fast as she could to allot more of her precious time to cards. This made her prefer the church of the Carmelites, separated only by a small bridge, though the abbess was of a contrary faction. However, as both ladies were of equal quality and had had no altercations that would countenance incivility, reciprocal curtsies always passed between them the coldness of which each pretended to lay on their attention to their devotions. Though the Signora Grimaldi attended but little to the priest, and the abbess was chiefly employed in watching and criticising the inattention of the Signora. Not so Orondates and Azora. Both constantly accompanied their mistresses to Mass, and the first moment they saw each other was decisive in both breasts. Venice ceased to have more than one fear in the eyes of Orondates, and Azora had not remarked till then that there could be more beautiful beings in the world than some of the Carmelite nuns. 
The seclusion of the abbess, and the aversion between the two ladies, which was very cordial on the side of the Holy One, cut off all hopes from the lovers. Azora grew grave and pensive and melancholy, Orondates surly and intractable. Even his attachment to his kind patroness relaxed. He attended her reluctantly, but at the hours of prayer. Often did she find him on the steps of the church ere the doors were opened. The Signora Grimaldi was not apt to make observations. She was content with indulging her own passions, seldom restrained those of others, and though good offices rarely presented themselves to her imagination, she was ready to exert them when applied to, and always talked charitably of the unhappy at her cards, if it was not a very unlucky deal. Still, it is probable that she never would have discovered the passion of Orondates, had not her woman, who was jealous of his favour, given her a hint, at the same time remarking under affectation of goodwill, how well the circumstances of the lovers were suited, and that, as her lady was in years, and would certainly not think of providing for a creature she had bought in the public market, it would be charitable to marry the fond couple and settle them on her farm in the country. Fortunately, Madame Grimaldi always was open to good impressions, and rarely to bad. Without perceiving the malice of her woman, she was struck with the idea of a marriage. She loved the cause, and always promoted it when it was honestly in her power. She seldom made difficulties, and never apprehended them. Without even examining Orondates on the state of his inclinations, without recollecting that Madame Capello and she were of different parties, without taking any precautions to guard against a refusal, she instantly wrote to the abbess to propose a marriage between Orondates and Azora. The latter was in Madame Capello's chamber when the note arrived. All the fury that authority loves to console itself with for being under restraint, all the asperity of a bigot, all the acrimony of party, and all the fictitious rage that prudery adopts when the sensual enjoyments of others are concerned, burst out on the helpless Azora. He was unable to divine how she was concerned in the fatal letter. She was made to endure all the calumnies that the abbess would have been glad to have hurled at the head of Madame Grimaldi, if her own character and the rank of that offender would have allowed it. Impotent menaces of revenge were repeated with emphasis, and as nobody in the convent dared to contradict her, she gratified her anger and love of prating with endless tautologies. In fine, Azora was strictly locked up, and bread and water were ordered as sovereign cures for love. Twenty replies to Madame Grimaldi were written, and torn, as not sufficiently expressive of a resentment that was rather vociferous than eloquent. And her confessor was at last forced to write one, in which he prevailed to have some holy cant inserted, though forced to compound for a heap of irony that related to the antiquity of her family and for many unintelligible allusions to vulgar stories which the Ghibelline party had treasured up against the Guelphs. The most lucid part of the epistle pronounced a sentence of eternal chastity on Azora, not without some sarcastic expressions against the promiscuous amours of Orondates, which ought, in common decorum, to have banished him long ago from the mansion of a widowed matron. Just as this fulminatory mandate had been transcribed and signed by the Lady Abbess in full chapter and had been consigned to the confessor to deliver, the portress of the convent came running out of breath and announced to the venerable assembly that Azora, terrified by the abbess's blows and threats, had fallen in labour and miscarried of four puppies. For be it known to all posterity that Orondates was an Italian greyhound, and Azora a black spaniel. End of A True Love Story
Postscript of Hieroglyphic Tales by Horace Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The foregoing tales are given for no more than they are worth. They are mere whimsical trifles, written chiefly for private entertainment, and for private amusement half a dozen copies only are printed. They deserve at most to be considered as an attempt to vary the stale and beaten class of stories and novels, which, though works of invention, are almost always devoid of imagination. It would scarcely be credited were it not evident from the Bibliothèque des Romans, which contains the fictitious adventures that have been written in all ages and all countries, that there should have been so little fancy, so little variety, and so little novelty in writings in which the imagination is fettered by no rules, and by no obligation of speaking truth. There is infinitely more invention in history, which has no merit, if devoid of truth, than in romances and novelty, which pretend to none. Finis. End of postscript. End of hieroglyphic tales by Horace Walpole.